The MMA Discussion Podcast here with Zach Hungerson making his MMA Discussion Podcast debut. Zach, what's up? Hi, everybody. Haha, <laughs> the ever loving beard. Probably the most powerful beard in all of MMA D right now. Uh, <laughs> comment on that beard real quick. That's including the 21,500 members that we have, too. I would challenge anybody to please. I, I, I want you to. section bro. post pictures of your beards so you can be. Yeah, post pictures of your beards on on the Facebook discussion uh, Facebook page for us, and Zach will challenge you to a beard off. We want it. We want to see it happen, because this guy has a legendary beard. He's got the green arrow beards, as I like to call it. Our fourth podcast, Zach, I'm glad, glad to finally have you on, one of our more poetic members on the page. We're going to start off. I don't do justice just speaking off the cuff, because I did not prepare at all for this. Oh, we never do. We don't prepare at all. I just tell you what we'll talk about and we just get it done. First bit of news to start off with uh, was announced uh, here, here on April 9th that DC uh, versus Hendo will be moved to UFC 173. If Hendo is not cleared to fight at that card, which I don't think he will now that I think about it, but if he's not, then Ryan Bader will take his spot. So we will have Daniel Cormier versus Ryan Bader if Hendo is unable to make it. And the reason I don't think he'll be unable to make it is because the fact that he'll be coming to, uh, coming off a fight so quickly in a fight where he had testosterone replacement therapy. Now he'll be fighting uh, his next fight and his fights thereafter without it. I think that uh, I think that he would appreciate more time. UFC UFC 175 probably would have given him the, the 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 right amount of time to be able to get off it and train properly without it. I think moving it to 173 kind of hurts him, um, and I and I think that that might be a factor in him probably not being able to fight at that card against Daniel Cormier. And on top of the TRT, you got to also keep in mind that uh, even though he did knock out Shogun, he was getting his ass handed to him for a long <laughs> and a half and was almost knocked out twice. Yeah, it's, so it's, it's hard fight. to see if even a doctor would be really uh, excited about the idea of him fighting so soon. So okay. I think that one's pretty tentative, and that's why it's a really good idea. They've got this solid backup. Bader's agreed to take the fight, so they haven't had shit in stone, and I think it's pretty much just hinges on, uh, on how the doctor's think uh Hendo's health is doing yeah I mean uh that was a great fight I mean I know we both watched it it was an awesome fight awesome knockout all around um I know you're bummed because you're a big pride fan altogether so seeing Shogun go down was a little tough I know that you're not the biggest Hendo fan after he knocked out Vanderlei there's a little history on Adam Zach there He's taken the most scorn from me. I hate Dan Henderson for what he did to me after Pride. <laughs> after watching the attack and Origomi Nick Diaz fight, one of the greatest fights in the history of MMA, to go off on such a low note, I just turned it off. Turned uh, off. <laughs> for at least a solid 15 minutes, and I knew that Vanderlei was over. And for those of you who don't know, Vanderlei is absolutely my favorite fighter of all time. He's the one who made me fall in love with MMA, and... Uh, I always have that place in my heart, so fuck you, Dan Henderson. <laughs> he puts on some great fights, and I do have a great deal of respect for the fighter, for the man. He's a good family man. You know, I can't truly speak ill of him, you know, so not too much hate on my criticisms of Dan Henderson. It's purely personal. <laughs> uh, at least you're honest about it. That's awesome. Have you been I don't know if you have. I don't think you have. Do you have Fight Pass? No, I don't. It's really almost not worth it um, outside of the United States at this point until they get the entire fight library online, which no. they're doing a better job of. They're slowly introducing the events. I think they do uh, now. I mean, uh, I'm watching... What I do with my fight pass is I watch all the UFC events chronologically in order now. That's what I'm doing with the UFC ones. I'm going to be doing it with the Pride ones uh, uh, soon after. Like, maybe I'll cut off around UFC 25 or something and then, in, and then interval. Um... I think they have them all on there, and I love watching. I love watching tough. It's a good season this season. Uh, a lot do they of have the full events, or do they just have the fights sort of chronologically? Well, and is it right from UFC one? And I'd I'd be surprised if they had right from Pride one all the way up too, because uh, those are some pretty rare archival footage. And uh, whatever whatever um, they uh, whatever they played on the actual pay per views that they would show is what's on there. Just that. I know that there are certain videos that uh, that you can uh, like see, like you know, uh, exclusive interviews and stuff like that that are like like pinned to the event that says, "Oh, this is what was there." Uh, these interviews, all this, la da 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 da. 
uh, stuff like that is on there for uh, for the UFC at least. And I'm only on UFC 10 right now, so I mean, uh, uh, they they're, like they they don't show some of the like those qualifying bouts for because they were still going by tournaments back then. Uh, they don't have those shown, um, which I wish they did, but I guess maybe they just didn't have the cameras on for those. Um, I, I gotta watch the Pride videos still. I still got a lot to watch, but I think they have them all. I mean, so for me, it's worth it. It's worth the money to watch all of that stuff again because I didn't start watching until like around the UFC late sixties. <laughs> you know I mean? Really, really got into UFC. Actually, I was in Pride, into Pride a little bit a couple couple of years before that, but uh, yeah. But around then, it was, um, I believe, when, was it Shamrock Ortiz? When was that? The third one that was on Spike TV, third. I believe, yeah. Yeah, and that was right before GSP took Hughes' title and Anderson took Franklin's title. It was all around that time. So I saw those kind of few events between, like, 63 and 66 that were just kind of pretty unbelievable. And then Pride was kind of fading by that point, too, and it became clear. So I had to kind of switch allegiances at that point. You had no choice. You were you were taken by the hand. You were told you were told yeah. what to watch. Fucking <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm, I hope Hendo stays on the card. I doubt it. Um, if he, if uh, let's just say for where that we know what's going to happen, DC Bader. How do you see that fight going? DC Bader. I think that uh, just Cormier is kind of a better better version of. Bader. I think he's got <laughs> faster hands, he's got more power in his hands, more precise striking, his wrestling is stronger, his top control is stronger, he can stand up better, I think he's just better altogether. The only question is if he actually sort of exploits how much better he is and actually whoops Bader's ass, or if he takes one of those safe decisions that he's kind of uh, tended toward the last little while, I feel like he secures the first couple of rounds, gets the nod, and then just sort of coasts to the end when he's got the potential to finish a lot of these guys. So I really hope he just comes out and starts throwing hands because he can finish Bader pretty quickly if he wants to. Yeah, I think I think Bader has more power uh, in his hands. I think uh, DC has better hands altogether. They're faster. I think he's... I think yeah, he's he power a lot better than Yeah, I think he's, uh, I think he's more crisp in, in, in the way that he strikes. Uh... I think he also throws a lot more kicks while they're obviously not as developed as, as one might think a pure kickboxer would have. He's not a pure kickboxer, and he throws some silly kicks sometimes. But he it, he does incorporate kicks. Sometimes they're effective. Um, yeah, he's learning, he's learning to use them to set up his takedowns better. And yeah, exactly. Well, <laughs> if you see the Roy Nelson one, he threw like a funny, like, like a... Well, <laughs> if you see the Roy Nelson one, he threw like a funny, like, like a funny type of spinning back kick, and then just like, came the butt of a few jokes. I thought it was funny, but the fact that he's incorporating kicks is. You remember? Have you seen it? Yes. Oh yeah. Uh, it's it's kind of. It just gives you a nice giggle. It's kind of funny. Yeah, I appreciate the effort. Yeah, actually, I'm gonna we're we're gonna bring something else in here. I know that we we did like a pre talk before we started the podcast. I actually wanted to talk to you about the. Uh, the MMA GOAT wrestling tournament that we have going on on the Facebook page that I started up. Uh, I wanted to get your thoughts on it and what you think. Uh, uh, I don't know. I think that uh, the results aren't necessarily quite as uh, accurate as they would be if the tournament actually happened. I just don't agree with a lot of the rounds now they've gone. But at the same time, it's pretty hard to define the GOAT wrestler. And I don't know if we'd maybe... Yeah, do you want to job know? doing that if we if we said, had to set pure like freestyle wrestling are these guys going into an NCAA tournament against each other or are they like fighting mixed martial arts and then subtracting everything but the wrestling because clearly MMA wrestling is a lot different so who's sort of more effective who's exactly. who's wrestling right. better in a mixed martial arts fight so it's hard to say kind of which we were looking for so I think that that's why the results have been a little bit mixed bet. Yeah, and 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 I actually. I have like a rule set that I place down, like a, like you know, a, a criteria, per se, my own that I put up, and it's very contradictory. Now that I re I was reading it the other day, um, it says I'll read the rules out. Uh, first rule: vote simply by writing down the name of the fighter. The and this is and I write this. I say this is based on a fighter's skill as a wrestler throughout their career, not to be based on other skills in an MMA fight. 
And okay, the next rule. This is a popular this is not a popularity contest. Your vote should be based on each fighter's wrestling ability when stacked against each other. Um, the purpose of this tournament is to determine which wrestler in MMA had the most success as well. So I, I kind of somewhat uh, go against my first, my second rule rather, uh, that, you know, it's based, like, it, what their wrestling skills would be other than, uh, I mean, to use their other skills in MMA fight and just focus on their pure wrestling and um, and determine, and then my third rule here, to determine which wrestler in MMA had the most success. And then, I, and then I leave one other criteria, which is to say, who's, who's the, the best wrestling work in the history of MMA? I'll leave it to your discretion to value offense versus defense. And how much you account time period and who had the most influence with their style of wrestling. So there's actually a lot to think about. And when people vote, they think about one of these or maybe two of them. It, it's really hard to think of all of them in, in one wrestler. Um, I think that the fact that uh, GSP was so influential, I think that that's why he beat DC. One of the most controversial calls of the first round of my tournament that I put up was that GSP defeated DC. A lot of pe a lot of fans were like, "What?" I mean, like if they purely wrestled, DC would own him. Or some said because he was an Olympic wrestler, based on that, he should he should own him because he uh, has you know d that may qualify his skills over GSP. Um, which I don't particularly I think, think it does. Winning that uh, that match off because, in my opinion, GSP just has an entire legacy as like one of the legendary champions in MMA history, and he utilized his wrestling to dominate guys who were known for their takedown defense and for their own incredible grappling and wrestling abilities. And you got to also keep in mind that the guy had no formal wrestling training up. Until he was sort of in his early 20s, late teens, maybe early 20s. He never did it in school. And he just talked on the scene. And he was owning Koscheck. He was owning Fitch Hughes multiple times. He outgrappled Sarah. He, like, these just beasts, these legends, in and of their own rights. GSP just made them look like children. And so, I don't know, just that's kind of why I think that people pick. GSP over DC because DC is still a fairly new kid on the block even though he kind of has the credentials and everything like that he still hasn't really kind of made that big splash on the MMA in any way he's just been all kind of hype up until this point so you know yeah. give it five years maybe it'll be a different question because maybe DC will just keep running through fools and he'll be like a two division champ who the fuck knows but at the same time like that's not where we're at right now and at this point I, I definitely would, uh, would have to choose GSP over DC yeah, and, and I think another matchup kind of proves more to the point of GSP versus DC when you put Mark Coleman against Ben Askren. Mark Coleman won very slightly by just two votes, I believe. Let me see. Yeah, two votes. He beat Ben Askren. Now, I'll say this. I think if Mark Coleman and Ben Askren were the same size and they wrestled, uh, I think Ben Askren probably wins that. But you look, but you look at everything that Mark Coleman's done. He's fought so many big names, and he's utilized his wrestling to get most of that work done. Um, Vented sort of wrestling dominance and utilizing it in tandem with striking. Like the guy's the, the godfather of ground and pound. So clearly, his his kind of impact on MMA again is way huger than Askren's. But I think that that one is a little bit more clear that Askren is one of the best wrestlers in mixed martial arts, period. There's no question about it. Mm -hmm. um, and Coleman, his pure wrestling was whatever, you know. Like, he never really did anything all that much with it, but he was sort of the only guy who did it. And he made his wrestling damaging, which a lot of guys up until this day still can't do 20 years down the road. So Yeah, you, know, you want to know a fun fact I found out about Mark Coleman was he actually competed, was on the USA Olympic wrestling team in 1992. I don't know why people don't know that, but he got only seventh place. It probably has something to do with it. But um, as an alternate, no, or he was on the team. team. Or did he actually go to Spain and compete? He went there and competed and got seventh place. Watch, I'll re I'll, I'll bring what? it up right now. Watch. Huh? Yeah, I didn't really know that. Uh, that his pedigree was. I was that. talking about it. Like there was a podcast that's just lost in space, as Chris likes to put it. That me and Chris and Blaze did that uh, that got ruined, and, and we were looking over his credentials, and I was surprised to see that that he went to Spain. I don't know if he was an alternate. Now that I'm thinking about it, but uh, he went an American Games gold medalist. Yeah, I know he did that. Ninety two, pretty good. 
World Championships 92, he got a silver. 91 Pan American Games in Havana, he got gold. Yeah. Let's see. I mean, this is such a based off. On the 92 Summer Olympics in Barcelona, that is correct. Yeah, so seventh in uh, in Barcelona, the one hundred kilogram. Yeah, see, I'm surprised many people don't know that. But um, see, that's yeah. a, that's interesting to me. And it was in the it was in freestyle, not Greco Roman. Um, so that adds a little bit more credence to kind of defending uh, Mark Coleman in yeah, that match. Yeah, it's guess. just it's surprising. I never knew that. Like, you would think that, if, I've been a big Mark Coleman fan for the longest time, I just never knew that until I looked it up. Um, well, we all have those blind spots, that was one of mine too, I did not know that. Yeah. Video. Real pedigree. Yeah, that's impressive uh, to him, I mean, uh, who know, who's to say who would win in Mark Coleman's heyday, but I mean, thinking of it right now, based on what I've seen from them in their careers thus far, I would pick Mark Ben Askren, but as far as influence goes, I think that goes to, to Mark Coleman more so, and I think enough influence goes, I think that goes to, to Mark Coleman more so, and I think enough to beat Ben Askren in this tournament. That was that was a, a point I was trying to make in defending Mark Coleman, I had voted for him myself, um, not only because I'm a fan, but just based on the influence that the man has had with wrestling in MMA. Um, is why I believe that, uh, you know, because he started using ground and pound at a time when rules were starting to really come together in MMA, you know, because guys, you know, in these early, I'm watching all these early UFC tournaments on the fight pass, and I see them, you know, just like hitting the back of the head, doing this shit, you know, doing so many illegal types of ground and pound moves that when rules started getting developed, he started, you know, showing you how to really get it done in there with, uh, with the, the unified rules that were starting to come up at the time. Um, as well as, uh, you know, I, I feel like he's had an amazing career. It's been up, it's been down. Uh, it ended uh, e even even near a high point. I mean, he, he ended his career uh, at a fine point, I feel, to be on the main event against a, another legend and Randy Couture, whether he won or lost. I felt that was a good way to go. Um, yeah, and I'm also really super, super glad that he didn't pull that Tito route or the the route that so many guys have pulled up just going way too long. Like, he really, really seemed to have acknowledged that his career was over, and he never took another fight in another organization after. His fight against Randy Couture was his last fight. UFC 109 is like well, you know, almost four years ago now, or over four years ago now, actually. So, uh, yeah, I'm very glad that he never came back fighting. Yeah, and he's doing his own thing. He's coaching now, and he actually has a gig coming up on the Ultimate Fighter season 19. He is the wrestling coach for BJ Penn's team on that season of the Ultimate Fighter, and we've heard... BJ's got a stacked little team going on. Oh, he there. does. He has... Who else does he have? He has John Hackleman, uh, Andre Pedneris. <laughs> oh, shit. That's a badass team right there all together, just those three. I know he has somebody else. He has a He has a stellar boxing coach. I can't remember his name right now. Jason something, but I know I've heard of him and he's and he's uh, done uh, done well. Just look it up for me. But that that my point was, uh, you know, I wanted to get that out uh, for people to hear it and, and understand the point I was trying to make when it came to GSP Cormier and uh, and Ben Askren, Mark Coleman in the tournament. Those were the two most debated topics as far as the first round went. And uh, and for those who voted on the post of Josh, Josh Koscheck versus Mark Coleman, which is in the second round, you'd be very surprised how close that one was as well. Very, very close matched. Um, and I'm excited to put the third round up. It'll be up next week. Uh, once Because uh, the last round of the second round is, is ending today with George St. Pierre taking on Tito Ortiz. We can already imagine who's probably going to win that one. <laughs> yeah, I... Uh... Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. Wait, who? Ortiz? Yeah. Just to say that his name is Jason Perillo. Is Jason Perillo? Jason, team coach for BJ That's a stacked team. I mean, Frankie has a neat little team too. He has Hanzo Gracie, Matt Serra. Who else? Yeah, somebody. Oh, and Ricardo. Yeah, pedigree on on Edgar's team too. Like Matt Serra is one of the great MMA coaches out there. You know, yeah. guy knows how to how to get his guys going and how to transfer his own skills to other people very effectively. So yeah, I mean, and he's got yeah. uh, 
Uh, he's he's going to have who? Henzo Gracie, Ricardo Almeida, Matt Serra. Um, that's a pretty good team as well. I know he has somebody else I can't just... um, Guest appearances for like Chris Weidman will probably come and do an episode. I wouldn't surprise me. You know, That'd be dope. Would... Yeah. One day Chris Weidman's going to probably coach a seasonally ultimate fighter. That's you. Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that'll happen. By the way, what do you think about Chris Weidman versus Leonardo Machida? I just want to get your quick thoughts. You and I are, and Chris told many fans what we thought would happen the first time around. I know they hate us for it, but what do you think happens between... That happened. Come on, people. What do you... <laughs> Chris Weidman in 2013 was the better fighter, and that's an end of it. He clearly hasn't established himself uh, in the way that Anderson did. He's not that legend yet, but yeah. he's getting there, and he's the one who knocked the legend off, and Anderson... He might come back for a couple of fights, but he's uh, yeah, he's he's done. Chris Weidman is the champ. I think he's going to beat Bill Machida too. Yeah. But I do believe that that is legitimately his biggest test at in the middleweight division currently. And uh, after that, I I'm really curious to see what's going to happen in that division because you're fairly short on contenders as 185 is fairly consistent. I think I think if Jacare wins one more fight, I think that dude's probably next in line if Vitor doesn't come back, uh, if he's not ready. Um, and a fight with Jacare is uh, very interesting. That guy's looked you know, savage as of late since coming to the UFC. He's undefeated, put some dudes uh, put some dudes away, and then recently beat Francis Karma. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, if... that was a win, definitely. Karma's a strong skilled grappler definitely. big dude too i mean he's obviously when you see yeah. that fight he, was, he had some size on jacare and jacare didn't let that let that change the the outcome of the fight at all move on now uh just for everybody uh participating in the in the wrestling tournament i hope i made it a little more clear to everybody who was you know giving me giving me shit about <laughs> about this tournament just keep we're the one who pick it, you know. We're only one vote each, so ultimately, yeah, I mean, you got you can you can inbox each other with people you disagree with. Yeah, if, if you if you really uh, another thing too is if you really feel strongly about a certain vote, explain why. And I love that you guys, some of you guys, explain it. You make great points, and and I really don't think there is any wrong point to make unless it's just stupid. Because uh, like my like I said earlier, my criteria is kind of contradictory in itself. I mean, uh, you you can pick wh which whichever wrestler with whatever criteria I laid out because it's kind of contradictory, as I said. Um, and, I, and like I said, unless it's stupid, there's really not r any wrong answer to give unless it's just obvious. I didn't put this tournament together with just guys who you know are give and takes away. I put in what I believed, and I took some opinions from everybody else. I put guys in here who I believed were some of the, who, who are the who will go down in history as legends of wrestling in MMA. I think all 32 guys I put on there will be considered that, and I, I'm not trying to make any mismatches in, into this thing, you know. I mean, there are some where you just look at and you say maybe they don't deserve to be in this at all, maybe they do. Uh, everybody has a difference of opinion. That's why I got many, many, many different opinions before I started this one off. I even took somebody out of this tournament, actually. I had Mike Brown in it, which was the one pick I was like, maybe I shouldn't have him in there, and I took him out and put Johnny Hendricks in, because everybody was telling me put Johnny Hendricks in, so um, and then the first round he loses, but then again he lost to Cain Velasquez. So I mean, you know, that's a pretty rough first round, though. Kane's. That is, I mean, it's Cain. You know, if I'd have put him against, I don't know, say who else is on here, maybe Jake Shields would have been a maybe different uh, outcome. Maybe he'd be in the second round. I mean, but the brackets were random too. So. The brackets were random for everybody asking me as well. Yeah, I put the, I randomized the shit out of this thing. So uh, I'd had no picks against who phase two starting round, and obviously no optimization, no patterning at all. It was random. No, it's, that's how. And and I'm going to do it. I'm a big Hendo fan. Uh, if not, I'll be rooting for DC because you know Bader's been disappointing me every time. I need him to do some shit. So I'm rooting for him to fight Hendo too because it'll finally give it'll lend a little bit of credence to uh, giving DC a title shot because at this point, you know. It, the classic line, you can't give him a title shot after fighting a barista. And that's just the truth. The guy needs to fight a top competitor. And yeah. Anderson, it's, everybody's respect till the end of time. So, you know, that's if you beat Dan Anderson convincingly, you know, nobody's really going to bat an eyelash if he's the next guy to face Jones. Yeah. But Peter, Bader's the guy you beat to then go on to fight Dan Henderson to then get the title shot. So I just feel like it's 
it's DC being It's him stagnant. doing this. You know what I mean? It's it's a it's 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 not bad. I mean, it's him doing this. He's working his way up, and and I respect that. I honestly it, thought that it's just, it, the division is short enough of contenders now that if he if he beats Vader, he's still going to get that next title shot. So, I, in my opinion, it's better to give him that next level of of competition and then give him the title shot. <sighs> Like I'm gonna get the shot anyway. I'd rather him do it off Henderson than Bader. I don't know. How I feel about that about him beating Bader and and then getting a title shot. I didn't like that Glover got a title shot off beating Bader. I mean that was his. Bader was ranked number ten when he beat him, and then he gets to fight the champion. And Bader's still ranked. Whoops, he ranked ranked number ten now, and uh, or ranked number nine rather. Sorry. And uh, I think that 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 win shouldn't uh, get him a title shot. I, I mean, especially when you got guys like Phil Davis, who has a fight coming up. So I think maybe we're speaking a little too soon. Let's wait until that fight happens, and then we can really see what happens for DC after that fight. Um, I would love for Davis to have, in this time off, become a finisher, man, because he deserves so much more than he's been given now. The guy's on the longest winning streak outside of the champion in the light heavyweight division. He's finished Gustafson in the past, and I know that Gustafson's improved immensely, but I still think that speaks to the level that this guy's at. So, you know, I, I don't necessarily think it's going to happen. I don't like his Hell. odds. He doesn't have that power. He's He's got great submissions, but at this level of MMA, most guys are very good at avoiding submissions. So when you're getting into that top five range, as I believe Rumble might be potentially. He's a little bit unproven at 205, but the guy's been a fucking monster since he's been stabilized in his weight and his strength training and everything. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, he, he's undefeated since losing to Vitor, which was a fight at like 195. Uh, and that fight happened at 142, I believe. Mm-hmm. Um, and that, and since then, so he's... Had to beat the shit out of Andre Arlovsky. That was ridiculous, too number of finishes at 205 like he's been on a fucking air right now and yeah. he's everything that it takes to to become a serious force in the division so i'm still on that fight for sure i'm because the way i'm not going to be upset because rumble will just take a huge catapult into the next level or davis is gonna possibly start on getting respect that he deserves so it's gonna yeah. be a good one I'm excited strictly just because I'm a big Anthony Johnson fan. I'm also a big Davis fan simply because he's made me a fan. He's a uh, he's done a lot in the in the last in the last three or four years that he's been around. And I and whether you agree with it or not, like I said before, I believe that uh, he you know a win over Leota Machida, a win over Nogueira. Um, you know, I mean, since then he's only a uh, his only what was it? His only hiccup was Rashad Evans. I mean. <laughs> That shouldn't even be that much of a blemish. Plus, when it happened in what 2012, been um, a little while. Yeah, definitely. So it's been a while. <laughs> you know what I mean? And since then, he's gone undefeated. Uh, I feel like he's way overlooked. I feel that that's unfair. And but again, I think that that's just the direction that the UFC has clearly been taking of favoring guys who are exciting, guys who get out there and throw hands and finish fights, and not even necessarily throw hands. What are exciting? There's some grapplers who can finish fights just as well, too, but they get the same level of respect and the chances that uh, not getting cut off of one loss. So, I don't know. That's a humongous part of why the guy's not getting it. Yeah, if Phil Davis uh, manages to, to finish Anthony Johnson, I want him to pull, like, a GSP shit where he gets on the mic and just begs for a title shot. He's like, look what I've done. I've done this. I've kicked his ass. I've kicked his ass. I can kick their ass. Jones was good too, man. You say you're never gonna get it unless you ask for it. Yeah, exactly. I think Chael Sonnen wrote the book on really showing you how you can get ahead in this business. Being outspoken, getting a fan following, people love that shit. When you get on the mic and and say some real shit, especially when it's, hey, I want this guy. I want to fight him here. I'll fight him here. I'll take me there. I want the champion. This, that, and the other. When you speak up in this sport, I feel it benefits you only. It gets you a fan following whether they hate you or they think you're a dick for calling a certain guy out or something like that. People are talking about you. If they're talking about you, it, it gets you noticed. The UFC will notice. And if they notice, then you get the fights that you want, I feel. And people like those qualities in champions, too. People like their champions to be a guy who's going to get on the mic and hype up the crowd and be engaged with the fans. They... I think that like, Kane is a good example of like a guy, if he had a little bit more personality, he would be a lot more out there. But he's not the one who's getting 
sponsored by Burger King and Nike and all these companies. You know, the guy is a beautiful mixed martial artist and a great guy, and he's very polite and everything like that, but he doesn't ever talk shit about anybody. He's very, very polite, very proper. He doesn't really get into beefs with anybody. Even his beef with JDS was, you know, meh. Yeah, JDS was, talked was, more shit than Kane even said, you know. He just that kind of personality based. So, uh, you know, that's a good sort of example of why it, it definitely pays to, to be a little bit louder because people like that in the champions too. So if you're ever getting hope to be groomed to be a champion one day, you're going to have to learn to, to speak well in front of the microphone. Yeah, I think if, if, like, that's, like, Phil Davis, if anybody can get it to him, tell him. If he wins that fight, call John Jones out. Call somebody out. Yeah. And that guy can speak too, man. That guy can talk. He's funny. He's yeah. very engaging. He's well spoken. He's clever. Like the dude can get on a mic and fucking talk. So nobody needs to give him a kick in the butt and say like you need to ask for what you want. Uh huh. I mean, Chael did. I mean, Chael talked so much shit, and sure enough, it got him the second fight. He won fights too, which is what Phil Davis is doing. If Phil Davis just took an ounce of what Chael is, is can do, and then he he'd be able to get that shit done. I feel. Yep. Yeah. Because he's got the skills to back it up. Yeah. We move on now to some news that was that came out earlier. Demetrius Mighty Mouse Johnson will be taking on Ali uh, Puncher King Bagatinov at uh, as the headliner of UFC 174. Hasn't gotten that big of a reception. <laughs> I love that nickname. Say that again. I said I love that nickname. Puncher King. Puncher King. Yeah, that's uh, that's his nickname. Uh, what do you think about that main event? It hasn't garnered as 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 positive as attention as as you would think it would. So I think that this is kind of uh, uh, there's a few things to say about it. First off, I think that anybody who is worried about the gate is ridiculous because Vancouver is stoked to have any fights. They're going to sell that shit out. Canada. Canadian MMA events, uh, UFC events, they sell out, that's it. So they're not really worried about it from that side. It's MMA events, uh, UFC events, they sell out, that's it. So they're not really worried about it from that side. It's going to sell. So anybody who's worried about that, don't be. The pay-per-view is a big concern because pay-per-view buys have been continually going down. And in my opinion, I do not think that Johnson is a big pay-per-view draw because he's been on a lot of free fights. He has not been marketed in the same way as the uh, as the larger size champions and that's sort of one of the dangers of being one of the smaller guys um, but on the flip side of that I think that it's wonderful that they're actually finally giving him an opportunity to headline a numbered UFC event that will be on pay-per-view so let him test the water to let him get out there on the network advertisements and on the posters and on all that shit and with a big fat number underneath him and, and let the guy become a star because I think he's got the personality to do it. He certainly is as dominant a champ as we have in the UFC right now. And uh, so I think that that could be a positive sign of them kind of uh, maybe thinking about marketing him a little bit more seriously as, as a dominant champion and as an incredibly fucking entertaining fighter to watch. Yeah, it's going to be fun watching him do an Xbox One commercial hype in this fight up. It's going to be awesome. I think uh, DJ is another one of those guys that, um, that, I mean, the UFC said that they want to use the Fox cards and the free cards to, you know, build up a fighter, and I feel this is, this is Johnson's big moment. He hasn't fought on a, uh, a UFC pay-per-view since, since he beat to meet, or Joseph Benavidez the first time to win the title, so that was about That's two years ago. Say it again? I said, and that was the co-main too, right? Didn't uh... he was actually supposed to? Like he, he and Joseph were supposed to main event that card, and then the whole UFC 151 fiasco happened, and John yeah. Jones got switched to that card, and it and it built it up, and it probably did better than it would have if it if it didn't have the Jones Vitor fight. Um, but uh, the fact that he's been on three Fox cards last year, and and he and he won all three of them, so con- like very convincingly. Well, not. The, the Dotson fight, that fight he actually got hurt, but he came back, he he uh, he, he ended up coming back, uh, he adjusted really well in that fight, and then the next fight he submits uh, John Moraga, and then the next fight he just absolutely uh, knocks the fuck out of Joseph Benavidez. Fun. Yeah, he had one of the best 2013s of anybody else. Yeah, I mean, he was a fighter of the year candidate for sure, and so... 
I think that that's why the UFC is feeling the time is now to put that guy on pay-per-view, see how he does. I think if they stack it with a decent uh, decent main card, uh, it'll do fine. I think it'll do around uh, you know 300,000 if they can put a good card around it. If not, maybe a little, maybe probably anything less around like 250,000. But I suck at those. I suck at those as it's been proven. I mean, you, you give me so much shit. <laughs> well, I'm just going to sell 650 and fuck out of here. <laughs> I think if... I said 350 and it was like 340. Yeah, so go ahead. I, tell him. I, yeah. sold a bit. I gave her a little bit more credit than she deserved. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's just... I think it would have done decently had the co-main not fallen off. I mean, I don't remember when I made that statement. Did I, I made it after the after the co-main had fallen off. Did I or did I not? I don't know. You're a big flip flopper too, so I think you probably adjusted it to within two days before the fight. You were accurate. <laughs> you were fairly accurate. Uh, in You'd given about twenty different. You're just estimates. mad because I I flip flop according to you, if that's the term you want to use. But I slip flop my picks for that fight, like the the fighters who I thought would win the fight, and. Uh, <laughs> Um, and I ended up picking every fight on that main card correctly. That's why you guys are sour about it. You call me a flip flopper, but yeah, I mean, I don't know how to call those pay per view things. I just think that um, I think it'll be viewed all right. I don't think it'll be viewed higher than the Ronda Rousey card. Uh, I just think it'll do decent. Um, I think Ronda Rousey card is now my sort of my my cornerstone from which to measure or like estimate all the other ones, and that's why I think like. Because she seems to be pretty solidly average on middle of the road, and there's no it, it, especially when you think about the especially when you um when you think about the the fact that her card thus far this year it's only been f- four months ish, three and a half months. Uh, that that her pay per view is the highest highest uh, bought one uh, as far as combat sports this year, and that includes boxing. Um. So, I mean, uh, that was just pretty sad. That means boxing is kind of doing harshly this year, too. Um, but that, that, goes, that goes to show how much drawing power she has on her own. Because that fight was headlined by somebody who refused to, to, to advertise it whatsoever. And uh, promote it, uh, rather. And then, uh, and then you had a co-main where, you know, the co-main was just kind of weird. Um, I, I think that... Uh, Johnson has a chance to really prove what he's got. Whether it gets bought too much or not, the fact that um, he'll get a chance if he performs like and he does some crazy shit. Say he gets another knockout or does a wild or it's a wild fight or he gets a, a, a slick submission out of somewhere. Uh, a, a, something crazy happens in his fight and he's the one who comes out on top. It, I think it'll definitely benefit him for the next time they put him on a pay per view card. Um, yep. You know, and then it'll get viewed a lot more, and that's how that's how you grow. You gotta you gotta keep uh, stepping up your game in in this sport. Um, I, I'm excited to see it. I think it uh, it'll be a great fight. I think uh, Bagatinov uh, he, he has a like he has a very decent sambo base. Um, I don't think it'll contend too highly with uh, with Demetrius's wrestling. Uh, I think uh, Bagatinov has uh, has one punch knockout power. He's proven that already. Um, and he uh, he can definitely uh, contend with Johnson on the feet, probably. Uh, obviously, Johnson pre- presents uh, one punch knockout ability all of a sudden, so he's got to be careful. I think it's an interesting fight altogether. Uh, how do you see that fight going? Yeah, I, I just I can't pick against Johnson at this point. He's, he's just right. one of those guys. It's like Jose Aldo, Jones. You're just dumb to pick against them at this point. Why? They've done nothing to, to give us any indication that they're going to lose. I just think he's better than everybody everywhere. So barring any of those crazy, you know, there's always that Sarah's chance. But, you know, smart money says Johnson. That's of course. Right. Yeah, we'll move on to the next topic we have. We do, we do breakdowns now until we run out of them. We're going to do a breakdown of another division just like I did in the last pos- podcast with Chris. Me and Zach will be breaking down the heavyweight division. Oh, shit. That's a fun division. Cain Velasquez, we'll start with him, the champion. He's out until uh, the fall time, sometime around there. Uh, and then, well, actually, you know what sucks about that is that the Ultimate Fighter will now have a Latino-based uh, uh, edition of it. And we, and Smart Money is on Cain Velasquez coaching it against either Fabricio Verdum or Travis Brown, the winner of that fight. Um 
Isn't there a rumored um, card, or I'm not even sure if it's rumored, is it confirmed the one that's meant to be in Mexico in like, November? Something like that? November? I don't, um, I don't know. Let's look that up. I don't know. I'd have to look that up. List of UFC events. I was the headliner. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, this is what I'm thinking, is that I think that they're definitely going to belay it to then, but it seems that they are ready and raring to go in Mexico. So I think that the question is just a matter of when um, when Kane comes back because they clearly want to have that guy that's pushing him there. Well, oh, shit. Yeah. The Ultimate Fighter Latin America finale will be sometime in November of 2014 and it will be held in Mexico City, Mexico. Oh, yeah, there you go. But there's no other Mexican card that I see... And I find it very hard to believe they would put um, Cain Velasquez on a free fight card. A heavyweight champion on uh, an Ultimate Fighter finale. Uh, that would be, <sighs> to say the least. Yeah, uh, that sucks too. I mean, But then again, if, I, if you're looking at the same Wikipedia list that I have here, there's 178 and then there's 181. And there's just a number of fight nights. and there's, So there's nothing 79 or 80. So it's hard to say if maybe they change that whatever we're looking at the end of the year anyway regardless i think that they're going to put off doing a show in mexico until kane's ready to go so i would be surprised if if it were this finale or if maybe they do this finale as well as ufc say 180 in mexico um but i feel like they just want to have kane fight there kind of as soon as he comes back they're just they're ready to roll in mexico am i the only one who who didn't know that there's a fight night card in turkey the fuck? <laughs> was not aware of that. That is, that's weird. There's one in Turkey, two in Canada. Fucking shocker. Uh, yeah, Sweden, I'm not surprising. I'm excited for the one in Japan, although I uh, haven't the slightest clue who they'll put on that card, although I'm sure they'll throw all their Japanese fighters on that card. And some Koreans and some... Chinese some fighters, Chinese, yeah. Chinese fun, yeah, cause... but look at that. They're also having a, 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 a fight Asian. night card a month prior in China. Macau again. And then, like, I'm just looking at all these fight pass cards that they're going to have. There's another one in Ireland, which will probably undoubtedly be hosted by Conor McGregor. Uh, I would think he'd be healthy by then. Um, yeah, and you have London and Glasgow and Montreal and uh, all you Canadians get all the good shit. All right. No fair. Because yeah, we come out, spend a lot of money on the UFC. I know. How dare you? I, so do I. At least I do. But you know, I'm not <laughs> no fair. I don't see one in LA, which is where I happen to reside. So bummer. Yeah, it doesn't seem like LA's ever really been too huge a hotbed for mixed martial arts, in spite of the size of the city. It's like, <laughs> more, it's like re- more, city. more so the reason why I need to move to Canada. <laughs> <laughs> We yeah, just had a fucking 14 month winter, so I don't really know if you want to. Oh, I don't up. give a shit. I can handle the cold. I don't give a fuck. It's all hot as shit over here anyway. I hate it. That So that's the champion. He's looking to fight, maybe. Hopefully, if he's healthy enough and they do the season of the Ultimate Fighter, Junior Dos Santos, or Junior Dos Santos, Cain Velasquez and the winner between Verdum and Brown will probably be the headliner of that in Mexico, and that would be a good fight. We won't know until we see Fabricio Verdum and Travis Brown happen. Number one on the list, no shocker, is Junior Dos Santos, who will be fighting Stipe Miocic at... At, we were talking about this earlier, that his fight uh, was moved from UFC 173 to the Ultimate Fighter Brazil finale, and it will be the headliner of that card. That is a good fight. Uh, that's a harsh fight for Stipe, I feel, but man, imagine if Stipe won that. I think he'd soar across the rankings and would be uh, in contention for the next title shot uh, as well, behind uh, the winner of Verdum and Brown after, possibly. What do you think of that fight? Uh, how do you see that fight going? I see JDS probably finding uh, finding the, that knockout punch in the third round. I feel Miocic will probably try to use a wrestling-based attack. I think he'll also try to use uh, decent footwork to try and stay away from Junior, but Junior's got uh, decent footwork of his own. He's one of the better boxers in MMA that, um, that we've seen ever. I think Miocic uh, will try and outbox him, but I think he will falter in doing that. We'll go to wrestling, and I think Junior will be prepared for it. I see him probably getting the finish, and this is a five-round fight if it's the headliner. 
Um, and I see that be there being a finish in the third round. Probably knockout, yeah. What do you say? I like that third round knockout. Sounds good. And for very much the same reasons, I feel like JDS has unbelievable cardio, and the guy just has power from start to finish. Even against Kane, you can say what you want about how much he was plotting at the end of it. I think that was more as a result of brain damage than it was as a result of him not having enough oxygen in his blood and his muscles. The guy yeah. probably could have gone for a jog after that in spite of having his shit pushed in for you know 22 minutes or whatever it was. Yeah, he's definitely one of the more resilient bastards this sport has ever seen. Uh, it's definitely a thing to behold. I just hope he doesn't take punishment like that. Uh, I think it's in his third, whether Miocic can hang on to him in that clinch for those periods of time and do anything inside the clinch because thus far, Kane is the only one who's been able to put a hand on, on JDS really, to be able to control him in any significant way, to be able to muscle him against the cage, to be able to take him down, and even Kane in his almighty wrestling a number of those takedowns were completely ineffective and JDS popped right back up again. Even after 15, 20 minutes of getting the ship kicked in, he was still able to get up from yeah. underneath JDS so, or underneath Kane. So I would be very, very surprised if Miocic could impose any sort of will on JDS. I think he's going to control, control the fight. Yeah, I see that. I see that uh, fight just like you do. I'm excited for it. Uh, Stipe can get the, the, the upset. Man, that does big for him. Don't think it'll happen, though. Two and three for BC Over Doom and Travis Brown. They'll be headlining the uh, UFC on Fox 11 card, which will be happening. When will that be happening? April 19th. That's coming up. That's 10 days from now uh, from the time we're doing this podcast. That's uh, today's April 9th. That is a awesome fight. And the winner undoubtedly takes on Cain Velasquez, as we said before. Hmm. I kind of favor Travis Brown here, and I'll, I'll say this strictly because he seems to be the more diverse striker. Um, and it's really hard to get a a, uh, a, a a certain, what's the word, directive on how Brown will look striking with Verdum. Uh, but I see him being able to, to outstrike him. He's, seen, he's shown he has awesome uh, knockout power. He's knocked out guys like Struve. And the thing about, the reason I have a hard time really seeing that is because he's ended fights like this. Just racketing his elbow into the side of people's brains. And uh, so yeah, those short strikes he was throwing against Overeem before. Oh my god, that was just that was one of my favorite finishes. It was just so oh good. yeah, slick man. I mean, I I literally yelled as loud as I possibly can, going oh, you know, just I lost it. I was like, I was mad too because you want to know why? Me and Blaze were having like uh, we were fucking. He he was swearing to all of us that 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 Overeem gets it. And uh, we were like, no, fuck you. Brown's going to win this fight. Pro I said by decision. Um, and sure enough, uh, Brown or uh, Overeem's kicking his dick in for a good two and a half minutes. And, and then he comes out with that kick out of nowhere. And I'm like, suck, fat dick, all day, Blaze. And <laughs> out of nowhere. And I'm like, suck, fat dick, all day, Blaze. And <laughs> he just, I mean, I, all we could do was laugh. It was awesome. It was a great, one of the best knockouts we'd seen uh, last year. Uh, it was very close in contention for our page for the MMAD uh, Knockout of the a Year Awards. Uh, last year, lost second place to um, to Chris Weidman's knockout over Anderson Silva. Um, Which is fair, you know. I, it's it, fair. I mean, when, he comes, when it comes to shock value. Time, so... Yeah, it's not even just a shock. Like, he dethroned like the greatest champion the UFC has ever seen with one punch. So. There's a lot of meaning behind that. You know what I mean? It won comeback of the year, which is very valid. I mean, it was between that and the Antonio Silva knockout, and I felt the Travis Brown knockout uh, was a better comeback because I felt Overeem was trying to actually finish that fight. And I felt like he had uh, gotten more damage put on him by Overeem, and it was all in the, in, in the course of one round. Um, he landed heavy shots, man. Those knees, like the jabs that were all landing, the big, huge, like he was landing hooks, he was landing overhands, he was fucking lacing yeah. around. Yeah, Overeem was very close to finishing that fight. I mean, if you had a shittier ref in there, it could have been stopped. So, you know definitely. I mean? or, or Herb Dean, the last few months, I believe, would have stopped that fight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
Go ahead and give your opinion on that. Actually, what's ref refereeing has looked so horrible this year. I mean, think about the EFA referee who let that fight go, the Bellator 113 ref, Herb Dean as of late. What's up? That's just a weird thing. Now that you think about it, how refereeing has been this, this year thus far. It's kind of scary. Uh, I wonder what's up with that. What do you think? Yeah, I, I can't really remember us speaking very fondly of year either though man last year was the year of like kim winslow really i think she was the the ref that everybody was talking about last year has anybody just, even seen her i haven't seen her ref a fight in a while haven't you I? know blaze and i met dan Mergliata at ufc 165 and i told this <laughs> we met him and big john very briefly big john was on his way out but Mer Mergliata stopped and talked with us for probably a good 10 minutes anyway and we of course had to bring up kim winslow because she was very recently the topic and uh, he proceeded to tell us that him and a few of the other refs had actually started a petition in New Jersey to prevent the commission from licensing her to ref in New Jersey. Now, and this is Dan Mergliata telling me this shit very openly too. Like you can you can probably ask him about it, and he'll tell you if you ever meet the guy. And uh, and so that I said I think speaks a lot to. The of her refing when other refs are, are ganging up on her and trying to prevent her from getting licensed and it also just seems like most commissions tend to band together too and try to be as uniform as possible so if she's refused the license in Jersey then it wouldn't be surprised me if the other commissions just sort of stop licensing her or stop giving her gigs anyway at least the big gigs, at least the UFC gigs and the, the Bellator gigs, the ones that, that most people are watching. Yeah, I mean, have you seen her this year? I can't I can't think of I time. can't recall seeing her in 2014 yet. So. Yeah, see, that's interesting. Oh. I wonder if maybe uh, uh, Dan Mergliata got shit done. I mean, I don't know. But... Simple, man. That would be fantastic. Man. <laughs> Jersey's, Jersey and, uh, and Nevada are sort of the two... You know, cornerstone commissions, the ones yeah, to watch. I mean, the ones they were the earlier ones. Plus, even before MMA came to light, they they were where they held the prize fights well, events. Yeah, the five rules of mixed martial arts were first were codified in in Jersey by Big John and his group there. Yeah. So that's that's the beginning of what we know as the unified rules now. Anyway, Nevada is obviously just the fight capital of the world, so it goes without saying that that's going to be an important place too. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, it's just a scary thing when you think about refing when that's such an important job when it when it comes to this business and to see that there have been two. It, for anybody that hasn't seen it, try and look throughout her page, look it up. EFA referee, uh, horrible referee stoppage, or the uh, Bellator 113 referee stoppage, horrible, both horrible stoppages. Like they they were they were they looked like they were contempt with letting the, the fighter die before they would step in. It was yeah, so it was bad. Take it really bad because there were just repeated hammer fists right to oh. the back of the head, oh. right on the back of the neck, the spine, like just smashing him in all the whole nervous system repeatedly. And the ref is just standing there doing absolutely oh, nothing. No, if like it comes out if you want to. Uh, like, be a little like vicious. Dana White. Dana White one time made fun of uh, of Steve Mazzagatti one time where he said. Or I don't know what fight it was that that uh that he said Steve did a bad stoppage, but he said that he like made fun of Steve by saying, "This is Steve before he started, you know, uh before he ended that fight." He's like, "Oh, probably gonna go home and clean my dishes and watch TV, maybe go to bed after." Oh shit, maybe I should stop this fight. It looked like that's literally what these two refs might have been doing. That's legitimately what they looked like they were doing. Like, they didn't give a shit. It was so bad. And, and I just hope that those referees have been have been suspended or they've just gotten their license taken away, period. I mean, if to give them any benefit of the doubt, take your classes over again, something. But, man, I, I was mad, more mad at the fact that the EFA, uh, the, the promoter, the guy who's the Dana White of that organization, said, oh, it's just the Internet, you know, throwing it out of proportion that it out. Sense, oh, fuck yourself it's like no dude we saw the video on youtube we watched what happened yeah We're all and horrible. we like felt every hit like you fucker like really go fuck yourself if you don't think that that wasn't a bad stoppage really so bad i felt i just man i was, I was one person man i everybody else other than that promoter apparently so. yeah man stupid okay. dumb i mean i hope i hope it gets better i hope 
Uh, I, I feel Herb Dean is taking certain criticism. I'm very neutral with him this thus far uh, until we see more of him. I feel he's still one of the better referees out there in the world. I do miss uh, Josh Rosenthal. Poor dude. Uh, Josh. Yeah. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, one of the better ones that we've ever had, I feel. Uh, hopefully he rests when he comes back. I mean, when did he get arrested? It was 2012, right? Or was it last year? Yeah, no, it was uh, like early 2013, I think. Uh, shit, and he's, been, and he's been arrested for three years, so he won't be back, even if he's allowed to ref, um, he won't be back till 2016. Oh, that sucks. Yeah, he's out in about 2016, back yeah. to 2017. That sucks. <laughs> even though it's federal jail, too, so he'll be at least be treated well. And the guy's, uh, you know, long-trained at jiu-jitsu and number of other martial arts. He's, he's a big dude. Up. I don't think anybody's fucking with him in jail. I think he'll be, yeah, he'll be okay. He'll be fine. Um, $16 worth of marijuana, though, across state lines, buddy. That'll get you in trouble. Yeah, I hear that. I mean, I kind of understand when you have... I mean, it's it's one thing when you have, like, a gram or some shit on you, but when you have, like, fucking barrels of it. <laughs> it was a factory. It was a full distribution center, warehousing, number of employees. He had a multi-million dollar corporation under him, Jeez. which he was a bad man, so... It's like, why the fuck was he even refing? What did he need it for, <laughs> Love the game. He really, really passionately is a lover of mixed martial arts and one of the guys who wanted to like. Love the game. He really, really passionately is a lover of mixed martial arts and one of the guys who wanted to like Big John continue to improve the sport to make it safer for the guys, to make it better for the fans. Mm -hmm. Like that's what he's about. That was his motivation. The refs make daily money. The guys they have to do other shit outside of just refing. Yeah, they have to like teach and shit. And Teach or the Big Johns and the Herb Deans, they're, they're celebrity enough that they get, like, uh, guest refing jobs in other places. They, don't, they get paid trips to fucking the Middle East and Africa and Australia. <laughs> and so, you know, if you're one of those guys, the Big Johns and the Herb Deans, the, yeah. you're doing all right. But, yeah, otherwise, you got to sell a whole pile of weed. Got you. I think... Uh... I still think uh, Herb Dean's one of the best. We'll see what happens as he as he goes on across this year. We'll move on to number four, Antonio Bigfoot Silva. As far as I know, he's still serving his suspension after being pot for having a little more testosterone than he was allowed to have for his fight with Mark Hunt. So that's nine months retroactive to the date of the fight, which means he's not allowed to fight until the eighth of month of this year. It's July? No, it's August. Um, so August... Who do you see that guy fighting when he comes back? I just hope that they don't still consider him sort of like a title contender or somebody who's even in he the He shouldn't, mix. not when you've lost to the champ twice. And the same you goes for Junior Dos Santos. The champ, you have, I don't know, like that. The Overeem knockout was a spectacular, obviously. But the Hunt fight. I don't know. I think that was very close. I personally scored it for Hunt. I don't really want to get back into that because it was a while ago, and I also understand that a large part of that was my personal love of Hunto, so <laughs> I'm not put too much into that. But I don't know. Just to see him get dominated like that, the guy's... He's one of those guys like JDS at this point. I just don't think he'll ever get a title shot as long as Kane is champion. And I just personally don't think he has the skills to get to that point anyway. I think he's very overrated. Um, and he's had some pretty brutal performances in the past. The Cormier fight, the both of them. You know, even Mike Kyle, a little 205er, almost knocked him out in the first round of their fight and then just basically got smothered by Silva. So it's well, really been all that impressed by It's really hard not to hit his head, though. So, I mean, that's one reason. <laughs> True, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, I mean, I see, I mean, Sean Jordan, uh, he lost his last fight against, so, uh, who'd he lose to? Uh, Mitrione. That's a fight, Matt, even against Matt Mitrione, I could see happening. That'd be a good one. I mean, it's definitely a, a way to pump up uh, Matt Mitrione or Sean Jordan, one of those guys. Actually, now Matt Mitrione sounds like it makes more sense because he's coming off a big win. Antonio is ranked. Wait, he's ranked number four. He, why is he ranked number four? Yeah, that's, thank you. This is what I'm talking <laughs> What the fuck? I was like, I was like man, we're already on Bigfoot Silva. He's four? Like a bottom ten person. Yeah. Like a Jordan or a Mitrione. One yeah. of the guys in like the 815 range. Like I'm, th like, I'm like, I'm talking about who I think he should fight. And I'm like, wait a minute. 
Wait, he's ranked though. So wait, he's ranked what? He's ranked four. That's fucking silly. That's exactly. really weird. That's okay. Like, <laughs> now you understand what I've been talking about. <laughs> I mean, just the the way that I, I I just saw myself processing that right now, and it just looks so silly. <laughs> it's so funny, cause I'm like, wow. Yeah, no, that's. Ugh. I mean, let's look at who else who else is ranked right now. I mean, I mean, we're going we're working our way down. Maybe we should have worked away from fifteen and up. Uh, but let's look. I mean, Brendan Schaub, maybe. Uh, Stefan Strew, that's a harsh fight for when he comes back. We're going to talk about him later. Uh, Frank Mir's number 10, but as far as I understand, oh man, that dude's lost four in a row. The fact that he's even ranked still is kind of weird. Um, uh, Who's that, sir? Huh? Who's lost four in a row and is still ranked? Right Frank Mir. Yeah, yeah, Frank Mir is one of those guys who's still riding years of who he used to be, former champ, and yeah. Fuck. He's not that guy anymore, though. Who's the last guy he beat? He beat Noguera, and Noguera's just right under him. Uh, Noguera has since gone 1-1 one and one after that fight, while Frank Mir went on to go 0-4. <laughs> um, and yet Mir's still ranked above him. Noguera. Yeah, that's weird, right? Yeah, that's yeah. fucking rankings. I uh, sort of having a little bit of a renaissance, kind yeah. of, in the last little while. Yeah, I mean... I don't even feel like we're going down rankings. I feel like we're just going against a list of the top 15 that's just thrown around because I don't know what the fuck to do with this division, I feel. I, yeah, I, I say Antonio Bigfoot Silva versus Matt, Trium Matt Mitrione still makes the most sense. I think that could highlight like our, our headline a fight pass card. Let's see. We had like, that list earlier. Um or a fight night even like that's a that's a that's a pretty good fight Mitch yeah that's what I'm saying whether it be here in America or uh, out in the states I feel like a fight night card headlining with Bigfoot Silva and Matt Mitchell makes sense Matt's headlined a fight pat, a fight night card before oh wait no it was a tough finale card uh, but he took it on short notice I think that that was supposed to be Nelson Carwin so that was why um, but Matt's fun to watch uh, uh, and he, and you know, when he does promos for a fight, like the one with, before, uh, Brendan Schaub, it's kind of, it kind of gets you pumped up for him. Oh, he gets out there and hits the media too, man. He gets on the MMA hour and he gets on all the different podcasts and he does yeah. had interviews with everybody. And he's Much. always really hype on the interviews too. The guy wants to make money and in more ways than once, so he pushes the fight, tries to get advertisers. And then he always tries to put on a performance too. That dude's looking for a bonus every time. Mm -hmm. So. I, think, I like that fight a lot. So it's, sure. it's a big fight for Matt. I mean, I can see why Silva probably wouldn't want to. He would probably toot his own horn a little too much and say, hey, I'm ranked number four. Yeah, um, definitely. Which is weird because, I mean, he's ranked number four. Where's Hunt? Harden's number eight, and he's above Roy Nelson, which I feel is, uh, I feel is fair. Everybody on top of him is uh, semi-fair. Overeem is a little, hmm, but he did beat Mir. Silver, Silver just seems completely out of place to be in that top five. Yeah, he shouldn't be in the top five. I think that's a little bit stupid. Um, for anybody else who disagrees, I mean, please tell us why. If you believe he should be on the top five, we'll go to without number five. Using word, without using the word Fedor. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He beat Fedor. He beat the okay. Yeah, I bet you a lot of these MMA media guys who do this thing probably took that into account. Yep. Which is stupid. Yep. Yeah. Um, we'll move on to Josh Barnett. Josh Barnett doesn't have a fight, as far as I, I know. Am I correct in that? I believe so. Yeah. yeah um, Josh Barnett. That's a good, uh, Who could he fight? Hmm. He could also fight Brendan Schaub. I mean, that's another fresh blood versus, you know, old tide fighter kind of thing right there. He could also fight Alistair Overeem. Uh, that'd be a great fight, actually. Now that I think about it, uh, Alistair Overeem being number six. What do you think of that fight? Who do you think he should fight? And, and, you know, both former pride fighters, that always, it makes it a little bit more saleable to certain people. Yeah. yeah I, I think, mm -hmm. Have they fought before? I don't think so. No, no, they've never fought. Because yeah, uh, Overeem was fighting at, uh, at middleweight, right, 205, when he was in Pride and, in pride and Josh, he was always a solid heavyweight, so they never encountered each other. Yeah, that's good. Well, he just had those couple of uh, off, like, open weight fights when he was in the tournament and stuff like that, but he never did very well. He never got to the, the Barnett level at heavyweight. Makes sense. I think uh, that's a good fight for him. I think uh, Josh Barnett, 
uh, Alistair Overeem. I picked that fight. That's a better fight. Two uh, old guard guys. Overeem trying to make another run, according to him. To him. Barnett is always just going to be that guy that's there. Whether or not he can be that guy to get to the championship uh, is yet to be seen. It's also still yet to be seen if he's technically a gatekeeper, as many people are already calling him after losing to Travis Brown, a guy who will probably go on to fight for the title. So it's a little too soon to say. Uh, Alistair Overeem, we just talked about him. Number six. Number seven, Steve Miocic fighting Junior Dos Santos. We talked about that one. Number eight, Mark Hunt. Mark Hunt doesn't have a fight, right? Nope, it's fine. Mm, that's another guy who could be matched against Alistair Overeem, and I'd be happy. Uh, and people have wanted to see that fight for a while, too, because they did fight, and, and Overeem was victorious their first time. Mm. Wasn't that only in kickboxing, or was that in MMA? Uh, no, that was an MMA, I think. Yep. I think I think he submitted him, correct? Uh, he gave him the old Americana key lock. Did he? <laughs> the old Americana key lock. You sound like Don Fry. Five in 2008, and uh, that was when Overeem was a fairly new heavyweight. I don't. He hadn't hit that full like 280. Yeah, he hadn't, he hadn't hit that fully Terminator Terminator look yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was very heavyweight version one, so you know he was a, a little bit more nimble back then. I like I like Mark Hunt's chances in, in that fight in stand up exchange. I feel like Mark Hunt's improved, and I feel like Overeem maybe his skills have improved a little bit, and he's more powerful, but he's definitely slower than he used to be. And uh, and Hunt's grappling has just gone up exponentially since he's been in the UFC. It helps train in at ATT with. Kane a lot for the while that he did, so he's become a pretty competent mixed martial artist. I like Hunt's chances in that fight a lot better this time. Yeah, I feel as I, I, I like that matchup a lot again. I, I would really hope that they come through with that. Yeah, is that you? Is that you making that noise? Yeah, sorry. Stop he it. Was... <laughs> Mark Hunt uh, over him. I like that fight too. I mean, if uh, say Josh Barnett over him happens, Mark Hunt versus I don't know, maybe the winner of. Of uh of Nelson Nogueira since they're both ranked under him. I mean that makes sense, yeah. What do you think about Nogueira at this point? I don't know. Is he making another like? Sh- I said the, I said the winner, not the loser. I feel if the lo- if if Nogueira loses this fight. No, but I'm saying even if he does win, like is he a guy we're grooming to give another title shot again, or is he kind of more? There's actually pilot? an article where Nogueira quote says he's looking at another run at the title. I forget where I read that. I think it was MMA Mania, but I think we all can agree that probably won't happen. Yeah, I think that's fair to say. Yeah, I mean, I think he's in it just for the fights and not for the gold at this point. He's, well, yeah, he's a, he's just one of those old school warriors, man. I think he's gonna guy. He's he'll be the classic. Just went for too long, and he'll yeah. I don't snap it, but where he's trying to go out on his shield, and I can respect that to a degree. I just hope it's not too far along after. I think he's been the guy who's taken a lot of damage over his career too. He's uh, he used to rely on that a lot in his earlier days of uh, fighting. Just get taken down on the ground take a beating and then just uh, out of nowhere pull an armbar out of his ass and he wins the fight but he got his ass beat a lot without getting knocked out like he was one of those guys who really rode his chin for a long time and it's held up too the guy still can take a fucking punch like you guys can but i don't know that that fades fast chuck had a good chin until he didn't too so yeah I think, uh, yeah, so then I think the, well, I mean, Hunt needs an opponent. Like, we're thinking of if he were to get an opponent now. He doesn't have an opponent in yeah. mind yet, does he? Let's see. Hunt. No, Mark doesn't have anything lined up. I feel like he might have been injured after that fight with, uh, with Silva. Yeah, Mark Hunt's injured. Yeah, he's injured. Yeah, he's injured. He's injured. He's at least, uh, at least it's not a no contest his last fight. I'm really uh, he broke his toe in the first round. Oh, that's right. So the toe was against fucking JDS. The, uh, the left hand against uh, Silva. He had the pins put in and everything along his finger. Uh, well, then I guess maybe the, the Roy Nelson O'Gara fight after after the fact the winner gets him makes sense. Yeah. Uh, say he were to fight Nelson, which I think is most likely. That'd be a fun fight. Uh, two guys whose chins are just fucking retarded. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, I think that, um, I think that it fight makes sense. He was on Nelson for a while, too. Huh? He was like, 
people have talked about Hunt Nelson for a while due to two of like the great chins in mixed martial arts. Yeah, probably street. it would probably go to it'd probably be another one of those fucking Antonio Silva Hunt fights just simply based on the fact that I don't see. Well, maybe it could happen, but it'd be crazy to see one of those guys knock each, the other out. The They've whole... both been knocked out before. It has happened. Oh yeah, it's yeah, I know that. It's rare that they do, but they are also two of the heaviest hitters in the sport too. So like. If one guy can knock the other guy out, it's the other guy, you know, so. I mean, think about it. I mean, Hunt almost knocked out Silva. I mean, remember, he dropped him in the third round of that fight. Um, man, I'm, I'm just thinking about that fight. It gives me giggles because it was awesome. I remember we were like, virtu- like we were talking on Facebook throughout the whole fucking car, just going, "Holy shit!" It's fucking like we were just like scoring it up round by round, talking about yeah, how fucking nuts it was. See me watching it. Like this is one of the, the best fights of the year. Like people are going to be talking about this one for a while. You know? Yeah, I was like, man, that fight was awesome. Yeah, Hunt versus Nelson would be fun to watch. Now that we move down the list, if you look at it, uh, at number 10, or number 9 is Roy Nelson, who fights number 11, Minotaur Nogueira, and we talked about it on the very first podcast with me, Adam, and Blaze. Uh, I gave my opinion. I feel Nelson gets it in the third round via knockout. The other admins, Adam and Blaze, uh, both agreed, thinking that Nogueira will probably get taken out in the first round based on his slow movement and Nelson having uh, decently fast hands. Fast enough to where they'll probably catch Nogueira. What do you think of that fight? Yeah, I, with that, with yeah. the rest of the too, I think that uh, Nog is just slowed down too much. <laughs> and that his chin just isn't quite what it used to be. The guy can still pack a punch, but Roy Nelson has massive power in his hand, and he's very fast. And he's been continually losing weight. Have you seen him lately? The guy is looking, looks better all the time. So Roy Nelson? Yeah. That's what I'm hearing. I've never seen any of these pictures that I've been hearing about, but... Um, but add to Facebook or follow him or whatever. Or like his page, I can't remember whatever it is, but he posts some pretty uh, frequent updates of him training with various people and different uh, events and stuff. So probably down to about 240 now, I would guess, so... He's looking pretty good, so, yeah. Cool deal, then. Right. Uh, we'll I'll, just, I'll play the devil's advocate, and I'll call it for a second-round knockout for Nelson. Alright, so you're just getting in between there. <laughs> just to be different. Alright. And we'll move on to number 12. Gabriel Napao Gonzaga. Does he have a fight? I don't think he does. And then, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't think he has a fight yet. Um, Gabriel Gonzaga. He lost that fight. Man, to be honest with you, now that I think about that, I'm remembering how that fight went. I remember thinking, man, that's it. That has to be it. That really must be it. I mean, going into that fight, he had two wins, two knockouts, um, and pri- and prior to that, he had a loss to Travis Brown. But then prior to that, he had wins over Ednaldo Oliveira and Ben Rothwell. He submitted both of those guys. He just had like such a good streak going, you know. And then and then he fought Stipe. Sure. And then he and fought Stipe. This guy who was retired a few years ago too. This is a guy who who gave it up after. After he lost to Randy and stuff, he had a couple more fights, but he lost his heart after that fight, really, and, and he retired for a couple of years and didn't plan on coming back, and then suddenly... Yeah, I mean... I there he it, is, he's making an impact. The guy's, like, breaking into the top ten of the UFC again. I never thought that that would happen. And I don't know, you can only hold a steep a loss against him so much. No, Yoshi. but you know what What, yep. what that, that fight showed me was just, man, that when that guy... When when you can get around him cardio wise, when you can push the pace, that's all you have to really do. That's it. I think you put the pay, push the. That's what Randy did. That's what Stepe did. Uh, Travis didn't need to because he just knocked him the fuck out. Um, Brendan Schaub did it with his wrestling. He pushed the pace on him. You do that against him, and it's just it. It's over. I, I just I think that fight really put like. Stipe put the kind of performance on him where it just afterwards Gabriel's name to me just screams gatekeeper, like uh, yeah, like yeah, he yeah, was running sure. so hot with his only loss in five fights being against uh, uh, Travis Brown. You didn't want to put any put that against him, um, and and that five and one record is his was his record, uh, um, post retirement retirement comeback, and now he's a uh, five and two. Uh, but that that just that loss really hurt him, like his image, in my opinion, like in my own head. That's how I feel about it. Uh, so those one-off shitty performances guys have sometimes. Like look at 
like a Shale Rashad fight. Like, have you ever seen Shale just get completely abused like that and just thrown down to the ground and into submission? Like, so. I don't know. It was something fucking off that day, and I feel like if Shale had fought Rashad on another day, maybe that was just the and I, and I think that was combined with possibly the best Rashad that we've ever seen. But I don't know. That just seemed to me like it was something off. That fight was just not representative. He didn't look in the, shape for that fight, really. They really took it on short notice. Apparently, he might have been like, like violently ill up until the fight, and blah blah blah. But Chael doesn't make excuses. He's not one of these fucking black house dudes. So you're not going to hear what happened. He's not Brazilian. He's not Brazilian. So, <laughs> uh, so you're never going to find out why he had such a shitty night. But I feel like. I'm going to give Gonzaga the benefit of the doubt and think that he might have just had a bad night because he's 5-2 he's and two his last fucking seven since coming back. It's not, a, it's not a small accomplishment. He's had a few finishes in the UFC. So, you know, who do you think you should face next, though? Uh, I don't know. I almost don't even care. <laughs> But just because it's just because of what I said, like I just like I mean, it just seems like. Looks true. He comes back against them. Let's. Yeah, uh, and that's the break. Yeah, that's that's, that's more break. Coming back because we wanted to talk about that anyway. Yeah, right? I actually forgot it. I'm sorry, but yeah, Stefan Stroop. Uh, I don't know who he talked to. He talked to some media outlet and said, "Hey, uh, my doctor cleared me. The UFC's doctors cleared me. I'm cleared. I'm ready to come back. I'm getting into training right now." After, say, three months, put me in there. For, sign me up for a fight. I mean, I mean that makes sense, too, because, I mean, he's, he needs to train. He needs to get his wits back together, fighting shape and all that. Um, maybe that fight, yeah, maybe him and Gonzaga, that makes sense. Uh, and right next to each other on the UFC is 15 anyway. So. Say that again? He's, why does it make sense? Yeah, I mean, they're both right there on the edge. One's 12, one's 13, correct? Uh, yeah, uh, Gabriel being 12, Struve being 13, which makes sense, he's been out a while since his, uh, uh since, what, what was his last fight? I can't even remember. Uh, but Struve is 9-4, and four. who was his last fight? I forget. Uh, Mark Hunt, oh, that's right, he got his jaw broken in that fight, I forgot about that. Oh, that smart, it was one of the most fucking brutal face punches ever. <laughs> brutal face punches. <laughs> yes, I remember that. That was in March, uh, so it was about a year ago. Yeah, we're just over a year now. Yeah. Yeah, that's a, that, that, that was a hard fight, but prior to that, he had four wins against Steve Bay Miocic, LeVar Johnson, Dave Herman, and Pat Berry. Three guys of which are no longer in the UFC. It's pretty sad, but he did beat Stipe, that's a big win, when, especially when you look how uh, Stipe's been looking lately, definitely, um, I think, uh, yeah, I think that fight makes sense, him and Gabriel Gonzaga, I think that's a good comeback fight for Struve, um, I mean, how old is he, Struve is still fairly young, if I, yeah, he's 26, holy shit, yeah, yeah he's only 26, he's still got a lot of time to, to really develop himself and, and make, and you know, still make a champ, I mean, he's still got all the time in the world, really, to, to really uh, go, uh, go out there and make a make a good championship run, which is insane when you look at how many fights he's had, he's had 31 fights, and he's only 26, it's a lot of fights for a young guy. Um, yeah, he's getting some pretty heavy punches, though, so he's one of those guys you want to see him stop taking so many heavy punches yeah but. i mean there's just something about that yeah there's just something about how he needs to really utilize his range better like i really wish he would <laughs> and, and he's improved for sure he has improved over the years if you watched him in his first couple of fights he used to fight like like uh, hector lombard or something he's trying to get him close and swing hooks it's like what the fuck dude? you've got the longest arms on earth and away from the dude it's, yeah, it's as long as a lot of guys like. like. I mean, like it's just weird that he doesn't see John Jones and go, oh, "I could do that." I just gotta, you know, yeah, build a little bit better, better muscle into his arms and 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 you know, learn when to stiffen out and and move around, get better footwork. It may have something to do with his footwork being that tall. Uh, may affect how he moves. But it absolutely does too. Yeah, for sure. And if you look at somebody who's that tall, they have 
pituitary gland issues that make him that fucking tall. He's not just a normal, really tall guy. He probably has a tumor or some sort of thing wrong with his pituitary gland that's caused an extra release of the hormone through his entire life. So I think he's had surgery on it to stop him growing. So he does grow a little bit more. He's, he's over seven feet now. And he was actually about 6'11 when he joined the UFC. Yeah. Um, and when he was like 23 and a half, almost 24 when he joined the UFC. So the guy was growing up until very recently. And so you need to look at his body. He's still getting used to it. Everybody remembers how awkward you are when you're 16, 15, 17. There's a few people who are just perfect the entire time but most people are awkward at least a period and so when you're constantly growing at that big rate for your entire life i don't think the guy's ever rich guy who stops when you're 18 or 19 yeah i mean so, i feel like those skills are, are still coming together just getting to know his own body is his kinesthetics is uh his, and his strength is increasing too the guy's gaining weight every fight he's a few pounds heavier than the last one so yeah i'm waiting for him to finally fill out his frame and get to like 265 and just stay around so there. 60 265 that's the shrewd we need to see man i would like to see that yeah but like i want him to build strength in his upper body more so I mean, his kicks already have power. I mean, he just really needs to learn movement. He needs to learn footwork better. To be honest, he needs to do just straight up boxing training. Like, and 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 I and, and I'm a little biased when I say that, just strictly because I'm pure. Bo- I started off with pure boxing when I was little, uh, and just looking at his footwork, like if he had the footwork of a boxer, oh fuck, he just jacked that guys up. He, he like a pure boxer. He has a he has a kick. just throw jabs all day. He could. Oh, my God. oh, he would jack your shit up. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I mean, he he has that he has that Dutch kickboxing kind of style where it's just kind of, it's not it's not it's not bad. It's just it's kind of loopy in my opinion when it, when it comes to me. I mean, I even I have very long arms. Probably not as long as yours. You're very tall. But uh for my 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 length, I'm pre- I'm pretty long and so uh uh for him, I can think that would work wonders if he just did pure boxing. If he came to the States and just did, like, pure boxing for, like, a year, uh, built a camp out, did two fights. That Queen's pure boxing, like, just pure American, British, Russian boxing, it focuses a lot more on, on avoiding damage, just slipping the rolling. Slipping the head, head movement, head. something I mean, he's, he's not movement. ever really had. <laughs> Boxers, type people, they're way more willing to take one to throw to you know they're way more willing to get in there and to take a couple of hard shots if it means that they're going to be able to set up that big fucking hook that's going to take their guy out they're willing to take that those bits of damage that extra not even bits but massive amounts of damage sometimes so i i think that for his evasiveness and for his damage minimization alone it would be it would benefit him very much to focus more on boxing and less on kickboxing and yeah, that's that's what I think he should. Uh, I mean, if I could tell him myself, I would. He's been one of my favorite heavyweights since I've seen him fight. The 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 one I saw the the Dennis Stoichik fight. However you say that guy's name, which was like the the bloodiest fight ever in history. Yeah. Yeah. Fight. Oh man, those oh, are yeah. fantastic. They're so entertaining. He man. puts on, yeah, he but always goes for it. Just, I mean, just ass kicked and then fucking make a comeback. And end up yeah, the, the Christian Moorcraft fight at UFC 117. Uh, one of my one of my most favorite fights of him ever because he just he he got taken down and the dude just like was just thrashing his face. But then, but then Struve comes out with just a fucking wicked combo and just straight punches him in the face and he's down. And then he uses that long like extension of his whole body to just stand over him and punch him with his left. I was like, man, what a one of the, I mean that guy has several really good comebacks. Um, and uh, and that's he's just so fun to watch. But yeah, I mean it's because of that style, because of the fact that he doesn't have much boxing to his to his game that he takes a lot of hits. I mean his head movement isn't as good. I mean if he did even just one year of boxing, his head movement would be a little better. Um, if you watch Muay Thai fights, man, they take just punches and punches. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I as a boxer just I, this is me. I as a boxer, this right here, this is me. This is what I teach kids because I teach box. I teach boxing to kids fourteen and younger at, at my kickboxing gym, and it's just I'm so into this. So being able to continuously be able to know when to retract your hands, get out of the way, protect your head, 
roll with the punches. It be able makes to so much sense. Yes. It just, uh, I just feel like if he implemented boxing better into his game uh, game plan, into his style altogether, it would benefit him in the long run. Uh, so I, I just hope that that's what he decides to do next. We move on to number 14, uh, Brendan Schaub. Who the fuck cares? <laughs> hey, what's up? As long as you don't need more grappling matches, I'm all right. Oh. Yeah, I know. Meta Morris needs to ban him. Gets his, yeah, he either gets his ass knocked out and he makes a really funny face, or he, <laughs> and he, or he wins by knockout or submission. Like the dude is in fights that end either way. It's always gonna. It's usually a pretty good fight. Yeah. You uh, see, like fifteen minute fuck fests with uh, with Shaw. Mm-hmm. Who could he fight? I mean, is Brandon Vera still a heavyweight? I don't know. I almost don't care to give him anybody in in, in the top fifteen. Like, it's awesome. huh? Because his <laughs> name, his name doesn't just stand out to any of the guys that we've talked about in the heavyweight di- hmm, division thus far. Um, I don't know. Um, who do you want to see him fight? Uh, I really just think uh, he should fight maybe Brendan Brandon Vera. Ben Rothwell, we saw how that fight went. Todd Duffy? What the fuck happened to that guy? Yeah, what the Todd Oh, here, here's he, one that makes sense. Soa Pileli? Oh, yeah. That's so kind of making a little bit of a statement these days. Yeah, I mean, he beat Pat Berry as of least. That's a real fighter for him to, to, to come at. <laughs> Soa Pileli, yeah. I mean, him and Brendan Schaub, that really puts a that really puts a uh, in perspective where he's at, where Brendan's at. Uh, when when it, when you think of that fight, I mean that's a fight everybody would assume Brendan Schaub should win, but Soa uh, has looked really good in his last two fights since coming back to the UFC. Um, what is it? He knocked out uh, this Russian guy. I forget his name. Um, yeah, I forget his name. Uh, but he he beat shit. Oh, there's like three Russian guys signed to the UFC right now. There's more than that. Nico- Nikolai oh. something. I just I can't find it right now for the life of me. But something like that. Uh, but that fight, I think, makes sense. Uh, Soa Palili, Brendan Schaub. What do you think? And I think if that fight would happen, I would be rooting for Soa. I think Brendan Schaub would be smart and try and take a, a guy that big down. Probably wouldn't want to strike with him. Um yeah, I say, I say Brandon Schaub decision. What do you think? Yeah, Brandon Schaub, I think, is, a, is probably a more competent mixed martial artist. I feel that so uh, could could knock him out if Brandon didn't play stupid. But Schaub might be, you know, I don't know. He's a clever fighter. He's going to take it where he needs to take it. I think that he would probably he would beat so. I just don't like to hear that shit. They fucking love that guy. <laughs> It's true. Know. Yeah. Um, I just, uh, <laughs> yeah, Brendan, when it comes to Brendan Schaub, as long as he doesn't go back to Meta Morris, put him against some good heavyweights, I'm, I'll be I'll be all right. Just uh, seeing a guy back up and do the chicken dance for 25 minutes is just horrendous. Ugh. I, I'm, ex- I'm excited for how the heavyweight division looks. Um, mo- most excited to see Stefan Struve come back. That the mark, uh, see what happens with Mark Hunt, and uh, I hope Alistair Overeem and Josh Barnett. That's my favorite matchup that we made up thus far with this countdown here of the top 15 in the heavyweight division. Heavyweight division. I'm excited for that one most of all. If they make it, I hope they do. Hopefully, we can put some lead away. Hopefully, Joe Silva's look, listening somewhere. Oh man. Next time we come on here, I definitely want to do the middleweight division though, because I think you're wrong. I think there is a lot of good names at middleweight. Uh, I think Jacare should be next. We'll get into that next week. Just let me qualify what I said before. I feel like the 185 is very much like 205 in that Adams talked about this before too, I know, that there's a very big gap between, say, the top four or five and number six to ten. And it seems like there's never really many serious people where you would consider like or could even see them in a title fight. Like, in those two divisions, there's only ever maybe one or two guys where you're like, yeah, you know, I could see him facing Jones next. Or maybe if he gets one more win, he could... There's other divisions where it's like, you could pick two or three guys who would right now go ahead and fucking 
have a title fight, but I, I just feel like those are like there's just a big gap between the elite of the division and everybody else. That that elite is just very small. So maybe there's a lot of guys in the division, but I don't know. You've got Jacare, Belfour, and Machida some up next. And who's after that? So maybe we'll talk about that next time. Let me see. What I haven't even looked. Is. Give me a sec. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're just going on like on two hours now, so I just didn't want to. Yeah, how long have we been going? Just subject to you. An hour and a half, and it was just you and me. You and I can babble, my friend. Okay. You are my nigga. I've told you that many times. Anybody assaulted by that, you don't. Got, you don't I realize. You don't realize the level of love I have for this bearded pleasure of man. I love him. Love him to death. Have a black kid in, so. Say that again. I said, and Jonas is black, JP. J- yeah, we're friends with a black guy, so it's valid. It's fine. He's <laughs> in updates. He just chooses not to. Yeah, see? Because like, he's black. <laughs> he's lazy fucker, eh? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, he's, uh, he's, more, he's more concerned about getting booty than, than doing anything with our page, so. I love you to death, brother. I'm so glad to have finally had you on. Next time we have you on, I would love to get you and Krishan Shamungerson. As how do you pronounce it? You pronounce it because I don't even know if Sh- I said it right. Sh- Say it. Shamungerson. Yep. Cool. Yeah, we had Chris on last. He was crying like a bitch after the podcast because he said it didn't feel right without you. Uh, we'll try and get one in uh, Friday or Saturday, whenever you're free, whenever I'm free. I gotta. Uh, I know I have work in these and all this shit these days. We just do this shit for fun, people. Realize that. We're just doing this for our entertainment and your, our entertainment and your ears. So uh, I hope you enjoyed it, guys. Leave us some feedback. Let us know what you thought about the podcast, what you thought about what we had to say. Um, please continue participating in the, in the GOAT Wrestling Tournament. Uh, I love doing it. I love hearing what you guys have to say. It, it, it's fun for me to, to really go back into some of these fighters' career and really pay attention to them because you really have to do that for these 32 fighters I lined up. We are now down to, uh, after I do the eliminations here, we will be down to the top eight of those wrestlers, so get into it. Uh, get get your votes in this next round. And uh, Zach, it was a pleasure, bud. I love doing it with you. Can't wait to have you on again. Had a good time. Awesome. Thank you very much. And, uh... Hope everybody didn't hate our action all that much. <laughs> Ask questions in the comments for the next one. Give us some ideas of stuff to talk about here. Yes. All right, you Canadian bastard. I love you. Love you too, eh? Later. <laughs>